Hi everyone, welcome to the video. In this series of videos, I'll be explaining the super egg drop problem. This problem involves a lot of advanced topics such as dynamic programming, dynamic programming speedups, the lower envelope technique, binary search, and above all, a very beautiful geometric interpretation. This is part one of the series where I will explain the basic dynamic programming solution that runs in OKN square time and OKN space. The later parts will explain how we can bring down the complexity from OKN squared down to OKN log n time, then OKN time. So without further ado, let's jump right in. So here's the problem statement. You're given k eggs and you have access to a building with n floors. You know that there's some floor f starting with floor 0 all the way to floor n, such that any egg dropped at a floor higher than f will break the egg, and any egg dropped at a floor or below will not break. In other words, you can think of f as the highest safe floor that you can throw an egg from and not break. Now, each move, you're allowed to take one egg from your k eggs and drop it from any floor of your choosing. So you can throw it from floor 1, floor 2, floor 3, or even floor n. Your goal is to know with certainty the floor f before you run out of eggs, with the least number of egg throws. Now, I know there's a lot to unpack here, and you might be confused about the problem statements or the variables that we have. So let's take a small example to clarify the problem. So suppose you're given a building with three floors and one and only one egg. N and K are parts of the inputs, but F is unfortunately not part of the input. In fact, it's a missing parameter that you're trying to find with least number of moves. So for now, we'll put a question mark on all floors from one to three to signify that we don't know if it's floor F or not. However, since we know that at floor zero, any egg would survive, which would correspond to you not dropping the egg in the first place, then I will put a whole egg at floor zero to signify that an egg would survive from floor zero. Now, when you have problems involving an unknown variable that you're trying to find with certainty, it's often convenient to think of an adversary or some enemy who is actively trying to slow you down as much as possible from finding your goal. The adversary is not honest and he would lie just to slow you down. However, the adversary is consistent, meaning if he tells you some information, he cannot contradict it later on or otherwise you would confront him about his contradicting statements or his lies. Now, initially, suppose that the adversary sets the floor F to be the second floor. Of course, he doesn't tell you this. If in the first move you throw the egg from the second floor, the adversary can simply lie to you and tell you that the egg dropped and that you're out of eggs to continue the game. You're still not sure whether floor F is 0 or floor 1 and as you haven't explored floor 1 yet. You cannot challenge the adversary because he really could have put floor F to be the first floor from the beginning. So throwing the egg from the second or third floor would have broken the eggs and the adversary would have won. In this scenario, you haven't found floor F, so you lose in this game. Now take a minute and think how you can make a series of moves to find the floor F taking in mind the possibility that the adversary is lying to you in his response. I'm sure if you spend enough time, you would think of this strategy. Try throwing the egg from the first floor. If it breaks, then you know that the egg would break from floor 1, 2, and 3, and so the floor F is simply 0. This takes you only one move. However, because the adversary wants to slow you down, he might tell you, sorry, the egg didn't break. In this case, you've wasted one move. So you try the next logical thing, which is to now throw it from the second floor. Again, if it breaks, then floor F is just one. However, 
The adversary wants to make your life miserable, so he lies again and tells you that the ball, in fact, did not break. You've now spent two moves. Finally, you try throwing it from the third floor. If the adversary tells you that the egg breaks, you know that the floor F is true. However, if the adversary tells you that the egg did not break, then you know with certainty that floor F is 3, as you've explored all floors. This time, the adversary cannot tell you that you're wrong, as you already cornered him with the information he gave you before. It took you 3 egg throws to find floor F with certainty. In fact, you can generalize this argument. If you have n floors and only one egg, then the optimal solution would be to be n moves to find the floor F with certainty, and the moves would be to throw the egg from floor 1, floor 2, all the way to floor n. Since this example is a special case of the problem, let's take another slightly bigger example with bigger inputs. Suppose this time we have two eggs and three floors. In your first move, you can either throw the egg from the first floor, second floor, or third floor. For each one of your actions, the egg might either break or not break. Remember that it's the adversary who tells you whether the egg breaks or not, so he would always choose the branch that slows you down the most. However, it's up to you to drop the egg from any floor that pleases you. Now, if you drop the egg from the first floor and it breaks, you would know with certainty that the floor F is zero. If it doesn't break, however, then F might be the first floor, second floor, or third floor. If you throw the egg from the second floor and it breaks, then you would know that the second floor and the third floor are not F and so you only need to check where F is from floor 0 to floor 1. You can use the same argument on each branch of this tree. Now take a minute and think about the relationship between all these six branches and their relationship with the original problem or the root in this tree. Now, if you spend some time, I'm sure you'll see that the problem in the branches are similar and smaller versions of the original problem. When this happens, it's very useful to think of a recursive argument, or parametrizing your problem using your inputs, which are n and k in this case. Let us denote dp and k as the minimum number of moves required to find F in a sequence of buildings, starting with an egg and followed by N question marks using K eggs. In the original problem, we know that floor 0 is an egg, as any egg would survive from there, and we have N question marks after, and we're given two eggs, so the solution to this problem is DP32. Now, suppose we throw the egg from floor 1 and it breaks. Well, now we only have one egg left, but there are no question marks, so the solution is dp01. If we throw it from floor 1, but it breaks, then we have two question marks with an egg beginning at floor 1. Since the egg didn't break in this move, we can find f in dp22. If we throw the egg from floor 2 and it breaks, we will only have one egg left. However, we would only have one question mark to search over, and so the solution would be dp11. Remember that we only have the right to choose which action you perform but the adversary can choose which of the two branches we end up on based on your action. Naturally, the adversary will always choose to send you to the branch that delays you the longest time. Mathematically speaking, for this example, we can express dp32 as one move, which is the action that we take this time, 
plus the minimum of the three actions. The first action is throwing the egg from floor one, at which case the adversary would force us to choose the maximum of DP01 and DP22. For the action of throwing flo floor two, the adversary would choose the maximum from DP11 and DP12. Finally, the adversary would choose the maximum of DP21 and DP02 if you choose to throw the egg from the third floor. Taking the minimum across all of your actions should give you the minimum number of moves that you can find floor F in without having to worry about the choice of the adversary. If you understand this example, then you should be able to define a recurrence relationship for general n and k. In general, denote dp and k as the minimum number of moves required to find f in a sequence starting with an egg, then followed by n question marks using at most k eggs. In the first move, we can either throw the egg from the first floor, second floor, third floor, or all the way to the nth floor. If you throw the egg from the i-th floor, two scenarios can happen. Either the egg breaks, so now you have k-1 eggs, at which case we know that floors i, i-1, all the way to n are not safe for our eggs. But floor 0 is safe, and floor 1 to i-1 are question marks. You also know that you have k-1 one eggs left, and so this would correspond to dp i minus one, k minus one. If the egg survives, on the other hand, then we know that floor i is safe, while floor i plus one, i plus two, all the way to n are question marks. There's a total of n minus i floors that we can search using k eggs. The adversary would always choose the maximum of both branches to stall us as much as possible. And so we take the maximum of both of these branches. The one here corresponds to the move that we made when we throw the egg from building I. Finally, the base case of this recurrence is dp0j equals to zero, as if we have no more floors with question marks to search over, we have found floor zero with certainty. So we don't need any more moves to find floor F. Similarly, dpj0 is infinity, as if we run out of eggs, then it would take us eternity to find F, as we have no more eggs to try and search for the floor F. I'll leave the recurrence here so we can reference it while writing the pseudocode. Here's the pseudocode. We first initialize an n plus 1 by k plus 1 two-dimensional array. We set the base case dpj0 and dpz0, as we discussed in the previous section. Next, we'll fill in the table dp and k. So we loop over all pairs of nk, and for each fixed nk, we are going to calculate dp and k using the recurrence to minimize the maximum of the two branches. Finally, once we've calculated dp and k for all pairs, we return dp capital N capital K as the solution to the original problem. Thank you for watching the video. This is it for part one. If you liked the video, please feel free to like and subscribe to my channel. Also, if you're feeling rather generous, I'll leave a link to my Patreon account in the description. Thank you very much, and I'll see you in the next video.